Welcome to the CEC Report, the weekly program of political and economic analysis by the Citizens Electoral Council. I'm Robert Barwick and I'm joined by CEC founder and leader Craig Isherwood. Welcome Craig. Thanks Robbie. All right, today is a very special edition of the CEC Report because we're going to discuss one subject, why Australia must go nuclear. So Craig, while everyone's gasping, let me ask you, why should Australia go nuclear? Well, Robbie, I think we have to dispel on this program at least a lot of the fallacies and garbage that's been brought up about nuclear power over the last 40 years. Look, nuclear power represents the future of mankind, and without it, mankind won't exist. What the issue, issue at stake now is that, you know, we have to have forms of very high energy flux density that provide the sorts of energy levels and sorts of new technologies necessary to deal with populations that we're going to have now and into the future. Can you just explain energy flux density, what that means? Well, energy flux density is the amount of energy basically per square metre, right? And if you compare the different types of energy that we have, you take, for example, wind power. It's a very diffuse form of energy, right? Uh, which is what they build these giant windmills about. Then you have solar power, which is slightly more concentrated. But then as you go up, you've got fossil fuels. You're more, in a sense, more heat per unit area. But it's not yeah. just heat. It's more in a sense of work. And then you go up things like nuclear power and so forth. But I'll come back to that in a sec, Robbie, because I wanted to... Uh, one, one of the problems that we have, first of all, is a lot of people, and I've heard this a lot, say that, oh, we don't need to go nuclear because we've got that much gas and that much coal. And, and in Australia, we've got that much sun. And that much sun too. Well, that, that's a ridiculous argument, the last <laughs> one, right? Oh, sorry. <laughs> but the point is that it's not the issue, actually. The issue is the technology that we need to support mankind. Now, you've only got a certain number of technologies that can be uh, enmeshed or developed with fossil fuels like gas and you know, oil and coal. When you start to move to nuclear processes, both nuclear fission, where you're talking about splitting the atoms, as opposed to nuclear fusion, where you're talking about bringing uh, nuclei together, fusion, um, you're talking about magnitudes of energy and processes that become possible that aren't possible at lower energy flux densities. Therefore, this has a great deal to do with the sort of resources that you can liberate uh, in, in terms of the, uh, the planet. So that's the first thing. It's not an issue of just... Uh, having abundant amount of uh, fossil fuels. It's a matter of what technologies that we can actually develop as a human race for the future of the human race. The other thing is that Australia is in a unique position in that we have the largest reserves of uranium in the world. Some 24% of the entire uranium reserves are here in Australia. We're in the box seat for actually developing a uranium development uh, you know, your nuclear industry. Um, we also have an, uh, the, you know, one of the largest reserves of an element called thorium, which is highly underdeveloped. It's a radioactive element which can produce more energy than uranium. And it doesn't produce the byproducts that can be used in things like nuclear bombs. Now, the other country that has this thorium is India. And India, of course, is developing uh, thorium-based nuclear reactors. It, it also has a fairly large reserve of thorium itself. So in the recent period where you see that Gillard has come out saying we should export uranium to India, what we said and what we have said before is that we should be cooperating with India and other countries to help us develop a nuclear industry so that we can move into the 21st century with a higher level of technology. And this, you know, the, what are we talking about in terms of uh, the, this technology in terms of energy flux density? Right, well, let's think about it graphically. If I take one kilowatt, uh, one kilogram of wood and burn it, I can produce about one kilowatt of electricity from one kilogram of wood. And if you have a look on the chart that I'm about to put up, you can see that to produce from one kilogram of plutonium, five million kilowatts of energy. So you're taking a very small amount of very dense material and new technology and creating enormous volumes of energy for that. And that's the key to the future. That is the key to being able to uh, produce an abundance of electricity for and, our country. And, and in a way that's obviously much more efficient than having to go and level whole forests or dig up open pit mines of coal, uh, etc., when you can do it in that with that degree of efficiency. Well, there's no accident that a lot of uh, conservationists, former greenies, you might say, have now come to the point that they believe that nuclear power is the solution 
for the future. If you look at the issues of deforestation, for example, in India, where poor peasants are cutting down forests in order to get firewood, you can see the denuding of the landscape is out of a necessity because there is no alternative uh, for them to be able to find the energy needs that they need to, to cook or whatever with. Now, now, with plutonium, you're still talking about th those figures you've given on energy flux density, you're still talking about fission effectively. Yeah. And if we could go to fusion, the energy flux density goes even way off the charts beyond that. Yeah, magnitudes, right. I mean, it, look, I've got another chart here which goes through energy flux densities too from various sources to give people a sense. And this gets back to the issue of you know, solar radiation versus fusion and fission. You're looking at you know, solar you know, biomass, that is the, uh, the amount of uh, solar energy that's coming into uh, the biomass on the, on the face of the planet, uh, is about you know, 0.0002. That's how much energy per square metre is coming in terms of megawatts, right? Megawatts yeah. is what a th as a, it's a million watts or a thousand kilowatts. So you've got this very diffuse energy level coming into the surface of the planet. Then you have a look at fossil fuels where it's about 10 megawatts per square meter, right? That's your, your and then, then you move up into uh, fission, which is nuclear and processes like you know, the, the, the um, light water reactors and things we see. That's between 50 and 200 megawatts per square meter. But as you say, you start to move into this new technology of fusion, which has not really been, uh, which hasn't really been developed anywhere on the face of the planet to commercial grades yet. You're talking about a, a leap from, say, 200 megawatts per square metre to trillions. And if pe people can picture this by thinking, when you go from solar to fusion, what you're actually doing is going um, closer to the sun. Because solar is energy that comes from fusion anyway, just 90 million kilometres away, miles away in the sun. If we can replicate fusion on Earth, which is how the sun produces energy, you're obviously going to have a hell of a lot more energy from that process. What people don't realise is that fire, that burning fire, is actually an unnatural process in the universe. The most natural processes are nuclear and fission and fusion processes. So that's a pretty amazing uh, thought when you think about it, but it's, a, it's an artificial yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, form of energy. Have the you most told, natural have you, have you is told any hippies this that nature is nuclear. <laughs> well, <laughs> this is the brainwashing that goes on when you actually look at the galaxy, you look at the universe, yeah, you yeah. realize that you know the sun is a giant sort of like a fusion reactor. It's very misunderstood that we don't understand very much about it. You look at nuclear processes, well nuclear decay processes have been happening ever since the earth was was established, right? We've had the the, the development of various elements on the youth on the earth from the from the process of the transmutation of elements, the breakdown and transformation of elements. All right, well, when we come back, what we'll discuss is nuclear waste. Welcome back to the CEC Report, where we're discussing why Australia must go nuclear. So Craig, the big question, what about the waste? Isn't nuclear waste an unsolvable problem that basically makes nuclear power not worth it? Well, the first question I got for you is, what waste? Huh? <laughs> there is no waste. But this is, a, this is a mythology that's been brought up deliberately from the program to shut down accessibility to nuclear processes. And Dick Cheney was one of the key guys back in 1973 that was, was a leader in destroying uh, the capacity for reprocessing and, and the technologies for re, uh, you know, re, reconfiguring the nuclear uh, materials. Mm. If you have a look, and I've got another diagram here, uh, for example, if you look at nuclear fuel, right, 97% uh, of that is actually uranium-238 and 3% is uranium-235. Now, once it gets spent, once the usable uranium gets spent, you end up with basically 97% reusable materials in terms of, uh, that's what you hear about reprocessing of nuclear fuels. And then you have other products too, uh, high-level products that uh, that are a bit more difficult to deal with. But that's on the assumption that you're only using today's technologies. Yep. There has been research done, the Lawrence, Lawrence Livermore University uh, and um, laboratory, re laboratory um, and the research facility, well, the use of high energy laser beams, which when they hit these isotopes, the radioactive isotopes that come from these, uh, these so-called waste products, uh, can transform the half-life of these products. 
So there's a whole raft of technologies there that can actually so-called take this waste and trans transform it. So people get told that, and it sounds awful, that you know nuclear waste has a half-life of 250,000 years, and so they, therefore we're stuck with it for you know the human time. And they're told that because the people who are telling them that don't want to implement the political solution to solve it. Well, the with nuclear power of both the fusion and the fission type, we have a, a completely new frontier of technologies that have never been solved yet. So therefore, what we talk about uh, this whole industry, we're talking about a very infant industry. Therefore, yeah, what seems to be a problem today can be solved through the applications of science and technology. And isn't it true in some of these cases where they have used lasers and isotopes to change the, uh, the uh, half-life of nuclear waste, they've been able to take half-lives from you know, thousands of years, years. And billions of years down to seconds. That's right. And that's, that's, I mean, that's, that's been proven already at the level of the desktop and not in the commercial applications so much so at, at the moment. But another myth, uh, uh, from, from the discussion on nuclear waste, you think there'd be mountains of the stuff, right? Like, you know, unavoidable tons of it, right? Well, actually, if you have a look at this particular chart here, you find that there's an enormous volume of radioactive materials that are already coming from material that's already mined something in the vicinity of 50 billion tonnes, right, uh, on, an, on average, is radioactive material. However, on average, you might produce 1,900 tonnes of spent nuclear fuel, of which at least 97% of it can be reprocessed. I mean, this is the scaremongering that so comes there's, up. There's about 400 nuclear reactors in the world, and they've produced 1,900 tonnes of waste. That's right. But they have the capacity of producing energy, you know, multiply, you know, Greater, vast amounts of energy than uh, than you know these fossil fuel power. Yeah, power to, be, to be a little bit political here, it wasn't an accident that Cheney did this in 1973, and his allies, ironically, were the uh, Friends of the Earth, the Green groups, because of course it was part of what happened around the oil hoax, where when the oil hoax was pulled, and um, there was a, a a decision that because the U.S. dollar had been taken off gold, they wanted to make it a, a what they called a petrodollar. Right? They needed the world to stay addicted to oil. Mm. And when countries like Germany and Japan and China, etc., decided in the face of this, this energy shortage to go nuclear, the green movement geared up big time to launch an almighty assault on nuclear power, including here in Australia with Friends of the Earth and the Australian Conservation Foundation. And their, one of their key um, tactics was to ban the processing of nuclear fuel, nu spent nuclear fuel. Well, it's interesting you should say that because Colin Keyes uh, is a retired physicist and um, uh, an astronomer who spent 24 years at the University of Newcastle. And he wrote a series of books. Uh, one of these is Nuclear Energy Fallacies. I believe it's available on the internet, but we've got copies if people want them. And, you know, he goes through these particular energy fallacies. And one of the classic ones is Chernobyl, of course. Yeah. Now, our Minister for Pink Bats, or former Minister for Pink Bats, David, uh, Peter Garrett, um, who was at that time uh, the um, president of the Australian Conservation Foundation, claimed that over 30,000 people had died as a result of Chernobyl. And the fact is, it's about 60 people have died as a result of the Chernobyl accident directly. And that, and that's, and that figure you've just said is according to the UN, the official UN report. That's correct. Because yeah, peop some people died in the course of the initial explosion, others from the results of the cleanup. But in terms of the overall effect, the intention of the mass media, and particularly pushed by Australian Conservation Foundation, founded by Prince Philip and these other oligarchs like Prince Bernard of the Netherlands, was to shut down technology, to, to create false propaganda, to destroy the potential for developing these sorts of industries. Well, Craig, this year we've had a nuclear crisis that is arguably bigger than Chernobyl. We never thought we'd see that again in, in Fukushima following the um, tsunami. But isn't it true there that the rods that when, they, when the water evaporated off them and they burnt, those rods were the spent nuclear rods that the Japanese, under America's authority, have not been able to reprocess? <laughs> this is, the, this is the, um, the irony of it. And look, uh, people complain about, you know, look at the dangers of nuclear fuel, uh, nu nuclear process, look at Fukushima, example. It was hit by a huge tsunami from a Category uh, 9 earthquake. 
I mean, this thing actually withstood it, and it, you know, a little bit of the radiation uh, did it escape. That radiation has a half-life. Within a few years, it will have gone by half. It will become less of a problem. But see, this is where you get into this other fra fraud of the um, linear no-threshold uh, problem with uh, radio radiation, where the belief is that any radiation is bad for you. Right? Any radiation whatsoever is bad for you. And see, that's another mythology. In fact, without radiation, we could not exist as, as beings on the face of this planet. We're in an entire environment of radiation all the time. And the amount of radiation that we can withstand in terms of uh, an increase in background radiation is really quite substantial and sometimes beneficial, which is why you know, some people go to these health springs where there is a lot of radon gas and a lot of actual uh, higher levels of um, uh, radiation for you know, reputed uh, health benefits. And when the French did their nuclear testing at Murau Atoll, and there was all these claims about radiation there, the, the French scientists themselves went swimming in the atoll after the testing because they showed that there was absolutely nothing to be afraid of. Yeah. Um, but, that's, but that linear no threshold um, idea is something that's been used to s scare people all around the world. Yes, and that, look, if you have a look at this uh, hilarious chart that was put up uh, by, again, Colin Keyes, and I like to uh, remind people of this, if you look on this particular chart here, uh, you know, you get more radiation. Uh, sleeping with someone. Sleeping with someone. Yeah. You get more radiation from coffee, you know, drinking three cups a day. You get more radiation from your TV viewing, flying in an aircraft, than you do from uh, actual, uh, you know, from nuclear power stations. So, and we, so we live in a naturally radioactive environment. Yeah. And that's, that's a, you know, absolute necessary. Now, now, now some people will lose sleep tonight, Craig. There's no such thing as nuclear free zones, Robbie. Well, we better go down to Brunswick and tell the council. Yeah, that's right. We've got all their signs up. Um, okay, when we come back, we're going to discuss some specific nuclear technologies that can even make scenarios like Fukushima not happen. <laughs> Welcome back to the CEC report and our discussion on why Australia must not go nuclear. So Craig, we were saying just before the break that you've had the shock this year of the Japanese tsunami and the Fukushima nuclear crisis. Um, how would you guard against events like that or like Chernobyl in the future? Well, what the international community is doing right now is assessing how uh, the Fukushima power reactor actually survived a level nine earthquake and a tsunami. So they're now looking at how to build power stations against that sort of level of threat, which is a, look, this is a complete freak. However, it did happen, therefore they're reassessing. But there's also other changes in design that uh, can be used, and particularly for Australia, there is a different design of uh, nuclear reactor that we really should be producing, like on a car assembly plant, and that's what we call the, the modular high temperature gas cooled reactor, right? which are basically modular reactors that are, uh, that are then hooked together, multiple units of these, this is why they're modular, hooked together to be able to be placed anywhere that you want them, even on the sea, on the ocean. But there are specific benefits to these things being both high temperature and gas cooled, right? That's right, because there's no water in many cases. They use helium for cooling uh, in many cases. There's one particular example like that. But there's the other aspect is that you have new levels of technology relating to the fuel cells, like uh, you have these fuel cells, and I've got an example of these um, fuel cells here. They look like tennis balls, you know, round tennis balls, but they're actually cased, the actual nuclear pellets are encased in ceramics. So when you cut them open, you can actually see the outside is in a, in a ceramic material. The interesting thing about here, that t here is that the, the temperature of the reactor never gets hot enough to be able to melt the ceramics. So the fuel can't leak out and go everywhere. Plus, you have these things called uh, you know, graphite control rods that you can put in and stop. Uh, they absorb what's called the neutrons, and that stops the nuclear reaction. So what you find is if you just leave these things alone without, um, without actually modulating the, the, the reactor itself by controlling it, it actually wind down. And there's a fancy word for that, negative void coefficient. Or negative energy coefficient. A negative void coefficient, the same thing. They're just different measurements of the same so, thing. So, in other words, you can't have the, if the scenario of Chernobyl where when the cooling system failed and the hotter the reactor got, the faster the reaction happened, 
these new ones happen the opposite. opposite direction. If it gets too hot, the reaction stops. Chernobyl was a unique uh, accident. Actually, it wasn't an accident. It was a disaster waiting to happen because the, so the Soviet uh, had failed to follow the guidelines for that particular uh, power station. They had failed to do the maintenance. They had failed to do a whole a lot of things. It was a human-based, economic-based problem. It was not a, sci a problem of the science or the physics. These... It, you know, these are mostly buried underground, right? You, the majority of the, the reactor vessel is underground. So these, these modules can be just left where they are if there is a problem, but there can't be a problem with the negative uh, energy coefficient. Now the, cat the Catalyst program on the ABC a few years ago did a story on China's um, version of this pebble bed reactor technology, and they, were act they took all the science journalists and people could probably find it on YouTube if they looked it up, um, looked up pebble bed reactor in China. They took all the science journalists there and they fired up the just walked reactor away. and then they turned off the cooling system yeah. and any other and everyone's getting nervous because any, any other reactor in the world would blow up and it just went to sleep. Yeah, it's, it's shut down because it can't can continue without active uh, involvement by humans to actually keep the process running, which is exa exactly how you want it to have. Now, um, on the high temperature part aspect, uh, the, one of the benefits of high temperature, the, uh, these reactors being high temperature, is that you can actually get process heat off the reactors, like separate Directly. from mm. the mm. nuclear the electricity from the reactor. Well, you've got the, these gases that are transferring the energy off the reactor, which can be then harnessed directly into, uh, into process heat processes. They don't, they don't necessarily have to go through you know, turbines to create electricity and then go to create the uh, processes. So you know, you could set these, these modular reactors up in industrial estates, for example, where small, medium-sized factories can use the pro tap directly into that process heat. Yeah, it's, it would be better for Australia to have a network of small modular reactors all over the place in the local geographical areas rather than running high tension cables all over, crisscrossing all over the countryside. You can have these modular reactors, you know, 50 megawatts, 100 megawatts. If you've got bigger towns, you might want two, three, four hundred megawatt power stations. But the, as the, the advantage of them is, is that they are modular, they are contained. They're ve they're, they're, in many cases, like I said, they use uh, helium. Um, uh, gas to cool them, not water. Very little amount of water necessary, and they produce direct energy where you need it. And you know, we've proposed on our Australian Ring Road proposal of Lands Endersby that we have a network of these high temperature gas cooled react modular, you know, pebble bed reactors dotted all around the country to, in order to um, facilitate the uh, the building of a you know a national maglev train network where you use electricity to create electronic uh, electromagnetic uh, fields and it occurred to me craig that given that there's still so much institutional opposition to nuclear power if australia did this and we developed our country this way we would make breakthroughs in the application of nuclear power that could then be a gift to the whole world yeah the the benefits of nuclear power are only surpassed by the ignorance of the people who oppose it right because I mean, this is pure ignorance about, we're going to have nuclear power in this country sooner or later because this is the way the world has to go in order to survive the fu for the future. Okay, well, we've run out of time on that note and that's a good note to end on. So that's been our discussion of why Australia must go nuclear. We have all the backup material here you can order from the CEC, so get on the phone or email us. Thanks for tuning in and tune in for more developments. Mm -hmm.